Today's discussion is the first of two, of two sessions of this special event to honor the legacy of Professor uh, Post. Today's session will focus on psychological aspects of terrorism. And I'm really delighted today to be joined by some of the world's leading experts in the field, uh, including our, our Raymond uh, Grotto, uh, John Horgan, Ariel Marari, and uh, Jessica Stern. I will, of course, introduce them all uh, at greater length uh, later on. Please make sure also to tune in uh, tomorrow for the second session of this special event, uh, where, we, where the discussion will center around counterterrorism in the era of COVID-19. And tomorrow's uh, event will feature uh, Martha Crenshaw, Bruce Hoffman, Brian Jenkins, and uh, our very own uh, Boaz Gano, the founder and director of ICT, and my predecessor as Dean at the Lauda School. And let me also take this opportunity to, uh, uh, to thank Professor Gano uh, for your decision to hold an event to commemorate the late Professor Post, and also for assembling such a stellar panel uh, of speakers. And my thanks, of course, also go to the amazing team of the ICT, especially its deputy director, Stevie Weinberg, who is here with us, and um, researcher and senior project manager, Daphne uh, uh, Berry, for uh, the wonderful behind the scenes work. So we gathered uh, here to commemorate Professor Gerald Post, uh, who was Professor Emeritus of Psychiatry, Political Psychology, and International Affairs at George Washington University, where he was the founding director of the Political Psychology Program. He was a founding member and vice president of the International Society of Political Psychology, and he authored no less than uh, 14 books. Professor Post also worked for over 20 years at the Central Intelligence Agency, where he founded and directed the Center for the Analysis of Personality and Political Behavior, and where he created psychological biographies on uh, political leaders and, and other notable individuals. He played a key role, for example, in developing the Camp David profiles Israeli Prime Minister Benachim Begin and Egyptian uh, President Anwar Sadat. In his final book, Dangerous Charisma, written with uh, Stephanie Doucette, Professor Post offered a political psychology of President Trump and his followers. Professor Post received numerous awards, among them the Intelligence Medal of Merit, the Studies in Intelligence Award, and the Nevitt Sanford Award for Distinguished Professional Contributions to Political Psychology. Jerry Post was also very familiar with the IDC Herzliya, and he spent time on our beautiful campus on several occasions, most recently in 2013, when he attended the annual meeting of the International Society of Political Psychology, which was hosted that year at the IDC Herzliya. Um, Jerry Post was also uh, a good friend of Professor Erich Prinzak, who founded and uh, served as the first or second dean of the Lauda School of Government. The two also collaborated on joint research projects. They published, for example, a very influential article in terrorism and political violence um, called The Terrorists in Their Own Words. I too had the honor, of, uh, the honor and pleasure to meet uh, and interact with Jerry Post on several occasions. And I remember him as a kind, generous, and intellectually curious scholar. In fact, I owe the topic of my dissertation to, uh, to Jerry Post. In, uh, in early 2005, Post and I, uh, we both attended a workshop at NATO in Brussels. And as luck would have it, uh, I ended up sitting next, well, perhaps it was a strategic move on my part, but I ended up sitting next to uh, Professor Post uh, in, in, in the minivan that took us from NATO, from NATO headquarters to our hotel. Uh, ever inquisitive, uh, Post began grilling me, of course, on the subject of my dissertation. And he quickly figured out, I think that um, other than being generally interested in, in suicide terrorism, I really had no idea what I wanted to do for my PhD. Um, and so um, he heard me out and then he told me, uh, you know, Asaf, nobody has written the story of Al-Qaeda's use of suicide attacks. This was uh, three, four years after the 9-11 attacks. You should do it. And so in a couple of minutes of conversation, very close, solved a problem that had been eating at me for, for months, which was, you know, how the, hell, how the hell to narrow down my dissertation topic. Um, so this is just a small anecdote, and I'm sure that we will hear more stories about Jerry today from our wonderful panelists, um, all of whom, uh, I should say, knew Jerry Post uh, better than me. So we will proceed as follows. I will introduce every speaker in turn, and we ask our panelists for about um, 10 minutes of uh, remarks. And all of the speakers have made their, um, after all of, the, all of the speakers have made their remarks, I will uh, moderate the Q&A. We also invite um, our Zoom guests to send uh, uh, their questions, uh, please send a, a private message to Daphne uh, Berry, 
uh, and she will uh, forward that message to me. Um, if you are uh, watching this on, um, uh, on a live stream on Facebook, um, please feel free to also leave a comment on Facebook and uh, uh, we will hopefully get to your question. So let me now turn to uh, the speakers, which is uh, the real reason why you're here. And I will introduce them uh, one by one. Our first speaker is Professor Jessica Stern. She's a research professor at the Pardee School of Global Studies at Boston University. She has taught courses on counterterrorism for over 20 years, including at um, Harvard, at Boston University, and at the CIA University. She's a member of the Homeland Security Experts Group and a fellow at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. She served on President Clinton's National Security Council, and she was included among seven global thinkers in Time Magazine's 2001 series, which profiled 100 global innovators. She's the author of at least five books by my count, including on, on terrorism, including The Ultimate Terrorist, Terror in the Name of God, The Autobiographical Denial, A Memoir of Terror, and most recently, My War Criminal, Personal Encounters with an Architect of Genocide. But most importantly, uh, Jessica is a really kind and generous scholar. She's a true mensch, as we say here. I know this for a fact because um, she's been a teacher, she's been my mentor, she's been an advisor, uh, and I'm really, really so delighted to have you here, Jessica. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dean Mogadam. <clears throat> It's a great honor to be here with the generation of people who really created the field of terrorism studies. Thank you so much for inviting me, Dean Mogadam and Professor Boaz Ganor. I think it's fair to say that the rest of us stood on the shoulders of many of the people who are gathered here today, the whole discipline, in fact. Um, <clears throat> I was invited as we all were to deliver a paper in honor of Jerry. But as I reflected on the role that Jerry had on me and on the field, I found myself writing about Jerry instead of about my own research. Uh, so I, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my experience of Jerry. He was the first professor I met who worked on terrorism. I did my doctorate at Kennedy School and there was nobody there interested in terrorism. It was considered to be a rather eccentric topic. Jerry's work was very different from others. He was principally interested in individual motivations for terrorism, as was I, or at least as I would become. And he was also, as Dean Mogadam said, an incredibly kind and generous man, always interested in promoting the next generation of terrorism researchers. He's a model for all of us whose hair is beginning to turn gray. In looking back over the times I was lucky to spend with Jerry, I realized that he was always teaching me just by being who he was. I see a trail of pearls of wisdom. He loved to take young people under his wing, as you just heard from Dean Mogadam. Even if they weren't his own students, and even if they were largely self-taught as many of us were back then, needing a lot more training and a lot more wisdom. Soon after I met him, I think I was still writing my dissertation, he took me over to the CIA. Although I would eventually take a job in intelligence, this was an unimaginably exciting and exotic opportunity. I felt that I was entering a spy novel. He made the possibility of working in intelligence seem more real. The first terrorist I had the opportunity to interview was the neo-Nazi and also Caltech trained physicist, William Pierce, author of the Turner Diaries, considered to be the Bible of the racist right. Timothy McVeigh reportedly sold the book at gun shows and gave copies to all his friends. I tried to get Jerry to go with me to meet William Pierce. He said he wanted to. Pierce was living at the time on a 350 acre compound in West Virginia, where he hoped to attract many white supremacists to his whites only enclave and where he was busy plotting to overthrow the American government. His compound was significantly closer to Jerry's weekend home than it was to his office. So I kept offering to go visit Pierce with Jerry weekend after weekend, but somehow Jerry was always busy on the weekends with his family even though he said he wanted to visit Pierce. 
it occurs to me there is no doubt some wisdom in his inability to resist what seemed like an irresistible opportunity to me. He thought that spending time with his beloved family on the weekend was a better use of his time than hanging out with a neo-Nazi. Kudos, Jerry. Maybe my personal life would have gone better when I was a postdoc if I learned from his example. At the time I met him in the early 90s, the prevailing model of terrorism was an instrumental model. Terrorists were strategic, rational actors who were motivated by the ideologies they espoused. It was assumed that they aimed to achieve their stated goals and weighed the costs and benefits of attacks in those terms. Jerry had a slightly more complex view of terrorism that incorporated individual motivations. He said he accepted the prevailing view at the time, but he proposed that their, they, terrorists were not in fact motivated by their stated agenda. Individuals, he said, are drawn to the path of terrorism in order to commit act of violence. And they use a special kind of logic, which I would call marketing, and he called psychologic, to justify and rationalize acts they are psychologically compelled to commit. This way of looking at the world was not at all popular in the 1990s. Jerry was a maverick and I watched sometimes in sadness as younger psychiatrists tried to take him down. Part of the problem I believe is that there are so many terrorisms. Terrorism is constantly changing and how we view terrorism depends very much on whether we're looking at disciplined commander cadre organizations based in failing states or individuals recruited in the West, for example. For example, Jerry's view applies very much to the kind of terrorists we're worried about today, but it also applied to the terrorists I began interviewing in the 1990s. I want to just briefly read you a little bit of what Bruce Rydell, a CIA colleague of Jerry's, said about how he was viewed at the CIA. And I'm quoting, Jerry Post was one of the most important analysts ever to work in the American intelligence community. He was an innovator who had to struggle to get his place at the table. His insights directly impacted the most senior consumer of intelligence, the president. One of his, his most crucial insights was that foreign enemies like Khomeini or Hussein were not madmen. We might not like them, but we had to understand them. Saddam was obsessed with power, Khomeini with his search for justice as he understood it. Sadat was determined to be seen as a great leader, more important than his mentor, Nasser. Not everyone at the CIA welcomed Jerry and his psychological studies. He said, how do we know what, what people assume, how do we know what is in the mind of the per, a person we haven't put on the couch? This is a perennial question asked about Jerry's work. But Jerry's response was this, we have satellite photography that can zero in on the dimples on a golf ball, but we can't peer into the minds of our adversaries. Analysis gives us the answer. I think the same can be said as well for Jerry's view of terrorists. Another pearl of wisdom. I've noticed that many of us write about terrorism as if it were a static phenomenon. We extrapolate from whatever data we have today to say something about terrorism in general, when often what we have to say is relevant or true only at a particular moment in time. We now understand, as we, as we did not in 1990, that there are psychological differences between those on the left and those on the right. Thus, even though it might have made sense to talk about irredentist or hard left terrorists as rational actors, pursuing a clearly defined set of goals, it didn't make sense to extrapolate that finding to all terrorists. The last time the hard right was really an important uh, uh, movement in the United States was in the late 1980s, uh, when jihadis were also rising. Um, people were still I think following very much in the, the path of Thomas Schelling, who was undoubtedly a genius, but his way of looking at terrorism, which clearly influenced many analysts, was not what I was seeing in the field in the late 80s and 90s. 
I was very much drawn to Jerry's idea of psychologic because it resonated with what I was seeing, talking to hard right extremists or the jihadis who were becoming increasingly important in Southwest Asia. In preparing for my remarks today, I read a couple of Jerry's most seminal articles. One of the things that struck me is how much I was influenced by him or maybe just agreed with him, even though he was developing a theory of terrorism and I was acting more like a reporter. Indeed, I've noticed that every time I imagine myself as having come up with something original, it turns out that either Jerry or Martha Crenshaw had said it many years earlier. When he said, for many, belonging to the terrorist group may be the first time they truly belonged, the first time they felt significant, the first time they did what counted, I am reminded of what individual terrorists have said to me in their own words. One mentioned to me a decade after Jerry wrote those words that living on an armed compound was the first time he felt strong and that the leader had to be almost a psychologist to understand what each follower needed to feel significant and needed, anticipated, anticipating discussion that would take place among terrorists and researchers 15 years after he said his words. There is no uniform terrorist mind, Jerry wisely said. Still, he argued, people with particular traits are drawn disproportionately to terrorist careers. Why shouldn't that be? We know that people with patholog today, we know that people with pathological altruism may be drawn to join the special forces. Why shouldn't that be the case for some kinds of terrorists? We know that engineers now that are overrepresented among both hard right and jihadi terrorists, but underrepresented compared with the general population on the hard left. In regard to the engineers, that is true throughout the Middle East, but not in Saudi Arabia, where engineers are able to get excellent jobs. Diego Gambetta and Stefan Hertog attribute the overrepresentation of engineers to a combination of a particular type of mind, something Jerry would have observed, one seeking rules and cognitive closure and to unmet rising expectations and engineers relative deprivation. I think Jerry's arguments apply beautifully to the insurrectionists we saw on January 6th. When Jerry writes about the paradox of anti-government groups that are extremely anti-authoritarian with regard to the government, but highly authoritarian in their own groups and personalities, I believe he intuited something that we're debating about right now. Authoritarianism exists both on the right and the left. It is a personality trait that may even be partly heritable. Jerry has referred to terrorism as an extreme form of psychological warfare. That's something I say all the time, and I thought I made it up. He emphasized the importance of the leader who must be externalizing and hate mongering, capable of manipulating the slime, citing Eric Hoffer, of discontented souls. Yes, Jerry, you are right. The leader, he said, must be a sort of malevolent group therapist. But Jerry, terrorism is changing once again. When we look at who showed up at the Capitol, it wasn't just the, one, the most famous groups that we're hearing about. The Proud Boys, the Three Percenters, the Oath Keepers. The Oath Keepers and Proud Boys were clearly organizing what was happening. But there were many people who were not at all involved in terrorist groups. There was no malevolent leader who was manipulating the perplexed and the lost and the discontented souls who showed up that day. It was a malignant algorithm that fed people what they were already interested in, in order to make money off their spending time uh, where there were advertisements to, to be exposed to. I dearly wish we had Jerry's wisdom to teach us how to deal with this new phase of terrorism. But even though he's no longer with us, I'm hopeful his influence will guide us. Thank, Thank you. you so much.
Thank you so much, Professor Stern. And uh, I really appreciate your decision um, to spend the entire uh, time of your remarks uh, talking about Jerry because you really, uh, and I think, you know, one thing I came away with from your remarks is that, you know, Jerry Post has been criticized, right, uh, oftentimes by other uh, psychologists, psychiatrists, and other terrorism researchers, but um, actually his views have been a lot more nuanced than they have oftentimes been portrayed, I think, by other people. And so I think that came out very nicely in your, in your uh, remarks. Thank you so much. Um, it's now my, uh, my honor to uh, introduce uh, Professor John Horgan. Uh, uh, John Horgan uh, is a distinguished university professor at the Department of Psychology at uh, Georgia State University. He has a PhD in applied psychology and his research examines the psychology of terrorist behavior. His work is uh, uh, widely published as everybody who follows terrorism uh, will know. He's the editor um, of the journal Terrorism and Political Violence and has written and edited several books on the topic, including Divided We Stand, The Strategy and Psychology of Ireland's Dissident Terrorists, Walking Away from Terrorism, Leaving Terrorism Behind, as well as a true bestseller in the terrorism studies field, The Psychology of Terrorism, which is uh, now in its second edition, I believe, and has been translated into over a dozen uh, languages. John, it is uh, really so nice to see you again, and thank you so much for, uh, for joining us today. And um, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Just want to confirm you can all see my screen. Terrific, thank you. Um, thank you, IDC, ICT, for, um, and, and my esteemed uh, uh, colleagues and dear friends uh, for doing this and for uh, including me. I think it's fair to say, uh, as, as uh, my good friend, Professor Stern said already, Jerry was such a, a pioneer and a trailblazer that we could spend the entirety of our time here just hammering that home. Um, there would not be a psychology of terrorism without Jerry Post. And the fact that that is merely one <laughs> small element of an extraordinary legacy is a testament uh, to the man. I have to say, though, um, uh, my enduring legacy, my enduring um, um, uh, uh, memory, I beg your pardon, of Jerry's legacy is not just of him being an extraordinary researcher and pioneer in our field, but as someone who was kind and generous and supportive. And, and that's how I will always remember him. Um, as, a, as a graduate student, um, uh, I do remember reading some of his work on, as Jessica said, psychologic for the first time. And I remember feeling completely disillusioned and disheartened that I had no future in this field because Jerry had figured it, <laughs> he had figured it all out. He had mapped out the terrorist mind, he had mapped out the questions, he had mapped out the connections long before um, so many other of us would figure out what kinds of methods and data sources we could use to test those ideas. So, so I've also spent the last few weeks revisiting some of his, uh, some of his major works. And, and, and he, I think it's fair to say, was so ahead of, its, of his time um, that uh, um, uh, he, he really figured out so much before any of the rest of us uh, did. I wanted to spend my um, uh, time today talking about the field and talking about some of the lessons from terrorist psychology. Um, and, and this is a field that I believe has been utterly transformed in the last 20 years. Um, um, uh, I think Jerry would agree that it has um, it's come on a long way and its future is very, very bright uh, indeed. There are many, many lessons I think we can identify. I only want to focus on 10, each of which can be directly traced back to an idea associated with, uh, with Jerry Post. In no particular order, um, let's begin. Um, no overall terrorist profile has been found. Uh, I've said many, many times before and said to, 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 to Jerry and I've talked about this, I don't see this as a failure of research. I see it as the outcome of research. I see it as the inevitable consensus um, uh, about terrorist psychology that we have right now. And this was something that Jerry recognized um, uh, over 40 years ago. His work on terrorist psychologic and group dynamics was the first that I'm aware of to plant the idea that, to present the idea rather, that there, there are different 
types of terrorist groups, each of which might exert different kinds of influences and dynamics on, on people and might attract people in different sorts of ways. Mental illness cannot explain terrorism. That is not the same thing as suggesting that mental illness is not relevant. Indeed, it is. Um, we know that certain types of terrorism are now more likely to be associated attracting people with mental illness than others. We are increasingly coming around to the view and embracing the fact that mental illness might also be an inevitable consequence of prolonged involvement in terrorism. And we're seeing a lot of very exciting research, new and exciting research now, revisiting some of these older ideas about mental illness and, and, and breathing fresh life into an area that we once thought was, um, uh, was, was, was defunct. Terrorists are diverse. Um, if I had to uh, summarize um, of some of, of Jerry's contributions to terrorist psychology in a very crude way, I think this is one of the, the most important points illustrated from his research. Men, women, children, young and old, very, very young, very, very old, um, people from all kinds of education backgrounds, uh, all kinds of, uh, all sectors of society become involved in terrorism for different reasons, in different ways, they end up doing different things and they have different kinds of experiences. We've always known, thanks to people like Jerry, that terrorism is diverse. We've only just begun to think about what that means with respect to, uh, with respect to things like prevention. There are many similarities even across ideologies. Um, this was one of the cornerstones of Jerry's thinking with respect to identifying and teasing out what he referred to as the psychologic. It's very, very easy for us to be beguiled by um, uh, certain ideologies and to assume that, um, there are, that, that there's nothing that the extreme right-wing uh, anti-government uh, terrorist in the United States shares with the, the, the overseas jihadist. But once we strip away the ideology, that's when the psychology, the patterns, the pathways, the processes become far more apparent and far uh, clearer to us. We know far more about terrorist radicalization than we do about mobilization. Um, the last 15 years of research in particular, I think, has, has pretty much given us the ingredients for understanding the radicalization process. We know what drives radicalization. We know what the big picture issues are. We also know what the small picture issues are. We know the kinds of things that that, that, that constitute the grievances, that fewer moral outrage, that inspire people to want to not just talk about doing things, but to actually take action. What we know far, far less about is how people move from one sphere to the other. What is it that distinguishes, if anything, those who, 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 who cross the path to mobilization into action? That's still one of the, uh, the, 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 the lingering questions from from terrorist psychology. Ideology matters in far more ways than we think. Um, uh, Jerry and uh, uh, my mentor, Max Taylor, um, used to both say that terrorist ideology matters in at least two major respects. We can think about ideology in terms of, in terms of the content, in terms of, for example, what a particular ideology is all about. And Jerry asked lots and lots of questions about whether particular types of ideologies exerted different lures or draws over some people as opposed to others. But ideology also matters in terms of, of, of its psychological qualities, in terms of providing urgency to action, in terms of providing direction, a sense of purpose, a sense of meaning, and a sense of urgency to act now as opposed to later. We tend to focus more on, on the content issues as opposed to the process issues, but these are profoundly important lessons um, uh, in terms of thinking about how terrorist action uh, develops. Number four, involvement in terrorism is not a one-way street. Uh, the very first time that I, that I um, had the pleasure to meet Jerry was at a conference where we threw around ideas about the then um, unexplored issue of, of, of disengagement. 
and this um, um, what what now seems to be common sense, but at the time it was it was anything but the idea that yes, lots of people become involved in terrorism for lots of different reasons, but people can and do leave terrorism behind. They can walk away. They talk about disengagement, which is the process of, of leaving terrorism. Sometimes people disengage, they walk away, and they hold their views intact. They remain committed to the same beliefs and principles that either got them in in the first place or they acquired once um, uh, spending time with other like-minded uh, individuals. But sometimes people can disengage from terrorism and they can also de-radicalize. They change their views. So these are two distinct but related processes um, that we, we're, we're not entirely sure um, uh, you know, how they go hand in hand with, with each other. Somebody can be de-radicalized, but they might remain stuck in a terrorist group because they don't have any way out. Likewise, um, um, somebody can disengage from terrorism and eventually be radicalized um, a, a long time after the fact. Some exciting new research being done uh, uh, on these issues. For reasons unknown, largely unknown, the risk of recidivism to terrorism is very low uh, in contrast to other kinds of uh, criminal activity, other kinds of violence. Um, uh, this is one of the reasons why we see a lot of research, a lot of interest right now in issues to do with the development of so-called de-radicalization programs. Despite the risk of recidivism being low, the potential consequence, consequences associated with even one successful terrorist act are often, for too many people, um, uh, impossible to imagine. So, so this is one of the reasons why this warrants continued investment and development and thinking about de-radicalization programs. Jerry would be certainly one of the first people to suggest that we, there is so much we can learn from talking to terrorists, and 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 uh, all of my esteemed colleagues here would uh, almost certainly share that view. This is something that's it's easier said than done. Um, um, uh, it can be done with great effort, um, but we clearly need to do a lot more, uh, particularly in our prison system, to um, uh, to have conversations that are that are there to be had. And finally, um, one of the most exciting developments um, uh, uh, in terrorism research over the past 30 years now, I think has come directly from the kind of scientist practitioner engagement that Jerry Post was such an advocate of and for. We typically talk about terrorism and think about terrorism and do terrorism analysis and research in, in, in very siloed ways. We have academics on one side, we have practitioners and policymakers on another. Some of the greatest benefits can come from finding out what mutually relevant problems and solutions might be. One of the most exciting directions and developments in psychology of terrorism research has been not only thinking about the kinds of people that get involved in terrorism and the kinds of ways in which terrorism changes people, but also, but also the people who, who exist in that orbit. Researchers like Paul Gill and Emily Corner and others have shown to research on, 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 on low and active terrorism, for example, that there is far more given away, if you like, in the early stages of terrorist acts than they might previously be uh, aware of. You've all heard the phrase, if you see something, say something. Well, there is more and more evidence-led research now to suggest that it's not that terrorist activity in its early stages isn't being seen, it's just not being reported. So what are some of the ways in which we can encourage greater reporting, encourage far more research into the wide universe of, of terrorist bystanders? Um, uh, this might illuminate um, a whole new way of thinking about preventing, reducing uh, terrorism in ways that um, uh, we might not have previously considered. I could spend the rest of the day talking about how Jerry's thinking in terrorist psychology has influenced a, 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 a significant amount of research on each of these issues. Um, uh, it's fair to say that um, he figured out so much of this before any of the rest of us did. And, uh, and his, um, his, his, his legacy will loom large for a very, very, very long time. I'm proud to have known him. I'm proud to have benefited from his 
his his his knowledge, his experience, um, um, but above all, I will miss his his wisdom and his wit and his uh, his kindness. Um, and and again, thank you, thank you, IDC for um, for doing this. Thank you so much, Professor John Horgan, for providing us with also. First of all, you know, such a great insight into uh, uh, into Jerry and his his massive influence on the on the field uh, or on the subfield of psychological aspects of terrorism, and also for providing such a crisp overview of of you know how we've advanced um, in in research and in, uh, of psychological aspects of terrorism over over the years. Um, um, and I'm sure we'll we'll come back later on to uh, touch upon some of these issues that that you mentioned in your uh, crisp review. Um, all right, our uh, next speaker is Professor uh, Raymond uh, uh, Corrado. Professor Corrado is professor at the School of Criminology and um, director of the Institute on Violence, Terrorism and Security at Simon Fraser University in Canada. He's a founding member of the Mental Health Law and Policy Institute at Simon Fraser University. He has published over 150 articles, book chapters and reports uh, on a variety of, of theory and policy issues, including youth juvenile justice, uh, violent young offenders, mental health, and um, uh, terrorism. And uh, it's a pleasure to have you here, Professor Corrado. Thank you so much for being here. Please. Just uh, un unmute yourself, please. There we go. There, thanks. Thanks for inviting me, IDC, and uh, my dear colleague, Aaron Marari. <laughs> um, uh, it's interesting, the perspective that I, I I'd like to bring. I, 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 when, Gerald po, when Jerry Post um, started uh, his work, uh, I was at Northwestern uh, studying with uh, Ted Gurr, so I think he influenced my doctoral work and my master's thesis and he with this construct of relative deprivation and I stuck with that in, in my original doctoral research and, and plus my work with uh, Michael Stoll on the politics of terrorism. So I go way back and Jerry Post was clearly one of our, 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 our guiding lights on that uh, along with Ted Gurr and uh, Briefly, uh, I'll just quickly summarize where I ended up uh, it, it, um, from the University of Pittsburgh to, North, uh, to Simon Fraser University, I'm Canadian. So I went back to create a research institute on mental health and, 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 and violence. And it was my work there, uh, particularly my work in the 90s and in, in 2000s on a sample of 1700 violent young offenders who were in our prisons and we were developing psychological profiles of these youth, serial killers, a whole variety. And we also focused very heavily on the construct of psychopathy because uh, that became a, a major issue. I think as Jessica and, 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 and pointed out, the whole construct of you know, what motivates them to engage at this level of, you know, uh, of, of violence and what, what what I found was that the, again, the diversity. So even the construct of psychopathy, the stereotype was, was wrong. It was a spectrum. And then the other thing that we found in our, in our violence is these are 1700 youth. So we were able to project uh, into their thirties and forties from interviewing them between the ages of 12 and 18. And we found the strongest predictor by far was a comorbid set of personality disorders with psychopathy leading the way, but also we found all sorts of what we would call, uh, Ariel and I in our most recent, our NATO book that's coming out, what we were looking at were what what were the dynamics, as I think as, as Jessica and John pointed out, and Jerry pointed out, what were the structural dynamics that, that sort of facilitated these different types of comorbid disorders and, and and that's sort of where I want to go with, with my, my, my presentation today in, in saying that I think one of the challenges that, that Jerry had and, and we've had is I would say going to a more formal, a more formal methodology 
to utilize the psychological, the personality disorder perspective. And that's what I would like to focus on today is, a, is part of the, his legacy is going to the next stage. So obviously my work is influenced a lot by my work in psychology. And this is where I'd like to go today. Basically the issue that Ariel and I and, and Gunda Versner from the Max Planck Institute in Freiburg in our NATO conference, a workshop, advanced research workshop a year ago and in our book, this is the issue that came out was uh, the focus on a personality disordered terrorism risk assessment instrument. Because as, as, uh, as, you'll, as, as I proceed with it, uh, Amanda, could you? Just seeing where, go to my next slide. Yeah. Uh, what, the, our, what I'd like to do is say that these are the types of instruments that have dominated the, the counterterrorism literature and it became a big issue in Canada and in other because of the false the false negatives. So far or write a case like Omar Mateen and, 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 and others and uh, uh, particularly now on the right too and Jessica you brought out the whole idea of who went to the, the January 6th, the whole profile. Well, they were using these types of instruments uh, in, in, in intelligence and counterintelligence, uh, counterterrorism. But what we noticed when, when I worked with the, in the Canadian context with our national intelligence and police agencies, they were using instruments that uh, were, were downplaying the importance of mental disorders or personality disorders. And the focus was more on psychoses. So the argument that that I was advancing with with my colleagues uh, it was that we need to create an instrument that reflects where we are in in in, in the, on the forensic clinical side where my, my my work is focused. That the arguments and discussions of how to assess the level of risk or threat uh, were were downplaying what I saw as a key focus on on personality disorders. Uh, Amanda. Uh, so the key here is that the in, in the the debates in the diagnostic the DSM-5, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, I I believe were critical for us in understanding the range of terrorist types, per, uh, personality types. And the key there was that they were moving away in DSM-5 from the DSM-4 categorical notion. So we focused a lot on, is a person a psychopath? Is a person a narcissist? And that's where Jerry focused a lot of his work was those types, right? the, the, the focus on types where what was coming out of the research that I was looking at uh, was we should move away from the categorical to a hybrid of, of categorical and dimensional research. So the instrument that, we were, that we've developed is based on that combination. Amanda. Keep going, Amanda, please. Yeah. And here are, the four, here are the key domains that I think that formalizes a lot of what Jerry was saying. Uh, going into the formal structure, here are the five personality domains, and these are all spectrums, right? They're all dimensions that we're going to try, that we, we, we're going to measure in our instrument, the negative affect, attachment, antagonism, disinhibition, psychoticism. Amanda? And just to so these are the symptoms that we measure in our instrument. If you look at, uh, I think it goes very much to the types of themes that Jerry uh, developed over the years uh, on this case by case basis. And as you can see there, uh, the, the, the range, I won't go through them all because we don't have time, but I think they, they present a very comprehensive way of trying to assess individual threat and risk. And, and that's where, um, the, the, if you look at the domains, I think you see that they reflect exactly where the research is in neuropsychology. So DSM-5 is based on the theme, 
that in order for us to advance in understanding the importance of personality disorders on terrorism, we need to try and specify uh, rather than categorize types by looking at individuals along these symptom profiles for each domain. Again, I, I don't have the time to get in depth. Amanda? Now, what, what we did in, in, in our team here, at, uh, um, we added uh, from the work I was doing with Stephen Hart, David Cook, Kerrigan Logan on a comprehensive assessment of psychopathic personality disorder. I was responsible for validating the instrument on violent youth because classically, it's personality disorders, you're supposed to be 18 and over. I disagree completely with that perspective. The, the research on neurobiology shows that personality profiles and symptoms emerge much, much earlier. And, and so we added uh, the, those two domains from the, the CAP instrument, and that's the cognitive one. And I think, again, it goes a lot to what Jerry and, and Jessica talked about when you look at the authoritarian personality, uh, Adorno's notions, if you look at intolerance, inflexible, disillusionment, and planfulness, the lack of it often, confusion. And then the other one that I've worked out a lot with my violent youth samples are the sense of invulnerability, self-justifying, and, and critically, I think it goes to what John's point is, it's an unstable self-concept. So that I think is important about what Jerry, John pointed out was the, the idea that your identity can change. You can be, uh, and that's the whole notion of the radicalization process and de-radicalization process. Because we found that pretty powerfully in our study of youth. You could look at a gang, a violent gang member at 15 and then re-interview them at 25 or 26 because in criminological research, that's the cutoff point. You reach your peak, a sort of violent identity by 16, 17. By 26, 95% of those violent identities have disappeared. So that's the notion that identity is, is developmentally defined for most people. You know, Erickson's notion of evolving identity by age stage. So we added the identity domain. And then the, uh, the, the other domains, obviously, are the classic ones that I started off studying uh, ideology, and it's been the main focus. But then what I think is a real difference generationally, particularly on the right, but also on the jihadis, is the notion of criminality. That comes up again and again and again, particularly in the jihadi, but also now in, in, in on the right, uh, particularly gang related, right wing gang related involvement. Uh, so if you look down there, the, those are the, the, the low level criminality, violent criminality, and very, very importantly, the intimate partner violence. So the pattern of violence, I think, is critical. And you could see the history of violence and threats. And you saw a lot of that in the initial profiles of the individuals coming out of the January 6th. There, there's a, a long history. For example, the one father threatening to kill his children if they, if, if they reported him. Uh, so that notion. So we became very, very specific on that. Amanda? So again, uh, we, we, we were looking for these types of patterns, uh, the uh, emotional dysregulization and anxiety, I think, are the two critical funds we found in our study. Withdrawal and, de and, de and depressivity, uh, antagonism, grandiose, callous. And that's the key there. The notion of antagonism is reflecting more our, our psychopathy themes in, in trying to understand. And the psychoticism, I think, is very, very critical for the right, particularly for the right. And that's the big lion oceans, the, the QAnon that seems to be so overwhelming now. And interestingly, when we looked at the cases, uh, uh, it's global. So, the, so I believe that these are new, it's spread all through Europe, it's clearly global. And I think 
the notion of psychoticism takes us away from the, the notion of psychosis as being critical. So too much, I believe our instruments are focused on psychosis rather than the, the more, I think the more um, appropriate construct is psychoticism and that focuses on that, that theme there. Okay. So uh, um, if we can, Amanda, if we could. So I guess the, the, what we'd like to do is maybe just if we could illustrate how we use this in, on a case by case basis, and I'll just quickly turn it over to Amanda. So we applied this to uh, the Dil Dylan Roof case. And so just a little bit of background, I'm sure all of you uh, know about that, but just for those who don't, um, Dylan Roof was charged and convicted of a mass shooting that occurred in um, the summer months of 2015. So Dylan Roof fatally shot nine individuals in an African uh, Methodist church in um, South Car Carolina. And a former FBI criminal profile uh, profiler Joe Navro assessed Roof's case and his online manifesto and concluded that he possessed some paranoid and narcissistic traits. So we went through this case in a little bit more detail to see how it would fit in with this, um, with the PID domains. So we see that there is some paranoid and narcissistic traits from this assessment, as well as um, um, some other things that had occurred. So we see some psychiatric reports on Roof that um, concluded that Roof was competent to stand trial, but he also suffered from complex mental health issues, such as uh, social anxiety disorder, a generalized anxiety disorder, um, dep depression and autism spectrum disorder, as well as some schizotypal personality disorder elements. So um, the elements in blue are, are the things that we were pulling out of this case in particular. So we see the anxiety component as well as the depressivity and withdrawal. And also when you get into the aspects of, of the case in a little bit more detail, you see those elements of grandiosity and callousness that, that ca came out later when um, there was individuals interviewing him and assessing the case in more detail. Um, there was also a, a lot of elements of this unusual, un, unusual beliefs and experiences. Um, um, yeah, so he, he, he kind of saw the, the world through this distorted lens and believed that um, Hitler should be um, revered as a saint. There was a, a lot of other elements that came up in this case as well. Um, he also suffered from some severe anxiety around those issues as well. Um, just going forward here, um, to apply this to the cap domains, we see some intolerance and inflexibility in his um, ability to, to see the world and this uh, self-unstable self-concept. Um, he, he struggled with that as well as um, he had a hard time fitting in um, and saw his um, ideology of superiority um, to salvage his sense of self. So we see a lot of that component in this case as well. Um, and the ideology component, obviously, in this case. Um, so that's all I have. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Corrado. So, I mean, to summarize I, I, where it fits in, in Jerry's legacy, I, I think it's the attempt to formalize in instruments where his, some of his key themes that came out. Uh, I'll stop there, I see. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Corrado and uh, uh, and Amanda. And I'm sorry for uh, uh, forgot for having forgotten to introduce uh, Amanda formally. Uh, Amanda is a PhD student at uh, Simon Fraser University who uh, works at the intersection of uh, crime, computer mediated communication, technology, and uh, sexuality. Um, and I would also like uh, before we turn to our next speaker, uh, I would uh, uh, like to uh, uh, acknowledge several members of uh, uh, Jerry Post's um, family. Uh, um, there's a widow, uh, Caroline is here uh, with us. Um, Caroline, hello. Uh, and several daughters, uh, Meredith, um, uh, Kirsten, and uh, um, uh, Cindy. Uh, 
and I understood there are also uh, several grandchildren, uh, nieces, nephews, and, and other family members. So um, it's really uh, it's really very uh, uh, great and, and meaningful to have you here. Um, all right, our next speaker is um, Professor Ariel Merari, uh, next and last speaker, um, who is Professor uh, Emeritus at the Department of Psychology at Tel Aviv University. Uh, he also taught here at uh, IDC. Um, he's a senior researcher at uh, the ICT. Uh, Professor Merari served as chair of Tel Aviv University's Department of Psychology from 1982 to 1985. He also previously served as the director of the Political uh, Violence Research Unit at Tel Aviv University. He's been a visiting professor at several uh, universities, including UC Berkeley, um, Harvard. He was a senior fellow at the Belfer Center at uh, the Kennedy School at Harvard. Um, he has studied political terrorism and other forms of political violence for more than 30 years and has authored, co-authored or edited numerous books uh, and articles on this topic. Uh, his most recent book is uh, Driven to Death, Psychological and Social Aspects of uh, Suicide Terrorism, published with Oxford University Press. Uh, in addition to his academic work, he's also established Israel's um, hostage negotiations and crisis management unit and commanded it for uh, over 20 years. Um, Professor Morari was the, uh, one of the first scholars to study suicide terrorism uh, even before 9-11. And Ariel, I remember, of course, um, inviting you to the Fletcher School uh, uh, 20 years ago when I was a, a master's student. Uh, I remember your fascinating presentation there, which had a lot of influence on me and probably uh, led me uh, to pursue my own research on, on suicide terrorism. So uh, great to have you here and, and uh, please, Ariel. Thank you, Asaf. Um, and uh, let me start by saying that uh, it's an honor uh, participating in this uh, uh, conference, uh, uh, um, uh, honoring uh, Jerry Post. Um, the, the first time uh, I met Jerry was about uh, 40 years ago, I think when he came to Israel uh, in search of uh, information on the characteristics of uh, Palestinian hostage takers. Um, uh, actually, uh, I remember that meeting very well because I was uh, greatly impressed by uh, Jerry's comment um, uh, after I described uh, what we knew about uh, hostage takers at the time, psychologically, behaviorally. Jerry uh, kind of, uh, uh, kind of uh, nonchalantly uh, said, oh, well, uh, they seem to be very similar to the guys we recruit to the CIA. Uh, so uh, of course, uh, this is uh, something to be remembered. Uh, in the years, uh, decades actually, that passed since uh, the first meeting, we met many, many times in conferences and uh, privately uh, and collaborated on several projects. In the developing field of terrorism studies, which was dominated by political scientists primarily, Jerry was a pioneer in focusing on the psychological basis of terrorist behavior. I greatly, greatly appreciated his wisdom and enjoyed his company whenever and wherever we met. Now, uh, in memory, in his memory, I shall uh, talk now, uh, add my contribution, modest contribution to the, uh, uh, to the presentations, uh, the very, uh, very impressive presentations uh, of uh, uh, my uh, dear colleagues, the three speakers uh, that uh, we just heard. Uh, now, I'd like to, uh, add my overview, my point of view uh, uh, on uh, uh, the role of uh, the uh, individual psychology uh, of terrorists uh, to, the, um, uh, to the views, to the overall views offered by, by uh, the previous speakers. Uh, the question is uh, what drives people to resort to acts of terrorism? This is something that uh, intrigued me, uh, has intrigued me for a very, very long time, actually since the beginning of my career, which was uh, uh, 
more than 40 years ago. I mean, uh, Asaf, you read the uh, kind of an uh, old uh, CV <laughs> of mine. Now, in the course of several decades after the beginning of modern terrorism research, individual psychology was not regarded as a major factor in understanding terrorism. Some scholars discarded it altogether. As I said, the field was uh, dominated by uh, political scientists. Scott Atram, for instance, viewed exp explanations of acts of terrorism based on personality characteristics of the perpetrators as a fundamental attribution error, no less than that. Uh, now, uh, according to this approach, terrorism is caused by grievances or interests of communities, not by psychological char characteristics of individuals. However, whereas there is no doubt that organized or spontaneous eruptions of politically motivated violence are mainly motivated by interests of groups of people, the denial of the role of individual psychology as a factor uh, that uh, influences terrorist behavior ignores the basis, the basic fact that in a given community, which has grievances that motivate terrorism, only a small minority of the people actually engage in terrorist activity. Circumstantial factors alone are insufficient to explain why, given the same situation, certain people end up as active terrorists, whereas others do not. As John Horgan pointed out, I think in his uh, uh, book, the, the first edition of the book already, he published in, uh, uh, I think, 2005, the number of people who actually carry out violent terrorist operations constitutes only a small percentage of those subjected to the, to the presumed background conditions and triggering stimuli. Individual psychological characteristics that may influence terrorist behavior are not necessarily psychopathological characteristics. Still, high rates of psychopathology probably exist among certain types of terrorists. Uh, for instance, uh, suicide bombers, also, uh, I suppose, uh, lone actors as uh, data accumulates uh, uh, every day now. Yet many scholars have denied psychopathology as an explanatory factor even among suicide bombers. Some writers have based their uh, conclusion that uh, terrorists are normal as uh, uh, on the terrorist's ability to plan and carry out complex operations. It, yet it, it is uh, wrong to assume that persons who suffer psychological disorders are incapable of planning and executing complex schemes. This assumption probably rests on the image of a uh, mentally disturbed person as an acute psychotic. Um, psychological disorders, however, vary greatly and the ability to conceive and execute complex tasks depends on the nature and especially on the severity of the disorder. An acute schizophrenic patient or a person in the depths of depression would not be able to plan and, and carry out an uh, elaborate scheme of operation. This is not the case with milder forms of mental disorders, which do not impair planning ability or impede the energy to ex execute the plans. History is replete with examples of people who men with mental or disorders who displayed diabolical displayed diabolical efficiency in planning and committing crimes on an inordinate scale. Hitler and Stalin are blatant examples. Moreover, a specific terrorist task such as that of a suicide bomber does not require the capabilities of Hitler or Stalin. It can be carried out by just about anyone. On the positive side of behavior, numerous studies have found that the incidence of mental disorders among eminent artists and scientists is considerably higher than in the general population. Arnold Ludwig, 
for example, examined the more than a thousand biographies of prominent 20th century uh, personalities that included scientists, artists, and writers, businessmen, and social activists. He found that the rate of people who re resorted to psychiatric treatment or was twice as high in his sample, 26%, than in the general population, where it is just 13%. 77% of the poets in his sample suffered from depressive disorder and 18% of them committed suicide. So uh, I, I don't think that, uh, that uh, the argument of uh, uh, inability to plan uh, uh, is, uh, is uh, 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 tenable. Now, by and large, the opinion and the opinion that uh, uh, that uh, terrorists do not have uh, relevant psychological traits that make them more likely than others to engage in terrorism rests on the absence of research rather than on direct findings. Fortunately, empirical evidence which shows high rates of psych psychopathological background among terrorists recently has started to accumulate. Uh, there, are, there are studies uh, that uh, we have done here in Israel um, uh, on suicide bombers and uh, more recently on, uh, on uh, uh, lone actors. Uh, studies in Europe and the US, uh, uh, for example, very good studies done by uh, John Horgan, by Paul Gill and uh, Emily Corner, they have already been uh, mentioned here. Now, a source of confusion in the discussion on terrorist personality has been the focus on abnormality uh, in assessing the importance of individual psychologic, psychological traits. Most scholars have based their opinion on the apparent absence of signs of abnormal behavior, explicitly or implicitly interpreted as psychosis or extreme maladjustment, but ignored the possibility that terrorists at least in a given situational context, may have normal personality traits in common, not abnormal. Uh, um, in a way, the claim that there are no universal, universally common traits shared by terrorists is almost se self-evident. Everything we know about uh, human behavior suggests that there is no reason to suppose that all terrorists have a certain set of traits because in other types of behavior, we do not find a perfect correlation between a single trait or a set of traits and the behavior in question. However, we know that people who have certain traits are more likely than others to behave in a certain way. Vocational psychology is based on empirical evidence, which has shown that people who have certain personality characteristics preferences, habits, and talents are likely to succeed better in certain occupations than others. This does not mean that all lawyers, physicians, journalists, or social workers share the same traits. It merely means that, on average, people with these traits are more inclined than others to choose and more likely to succeed in certain occupations. Looking for a single personality type to explain all terrorists may also contribute to a sweeping premature conclusion that terrorists have no distinctive feature. It is likely that members of ter a terrorist group, of or terrorist groups in general, who are in, in charge of different tasks may also differ in their personality traits. It is also possible, however, that terrorists whose overt behavior is similar uh, e.g. those uh, who carry out uh, high-risk missions such as armed assault may exhibit more than one personality pattern. So we are dealing, as, uh, uh, as uh, John has already noted, we are dealing with, uh, with uh, a complex uh, situation. Uh, there are diverse types of, uh, of uh, terrorists, undoubtedly. In sum, to, to understand the motivation to resort to terrorism, uh, we must take into account the interactive influence of three factors. These are the political context, 
the group processes and individual characteristics. The, the notion that certain political conditions generate grievances that in turn drive people to terrorism explains why under some conditions people are more willing to use violence than in other circumstances. But it does not explain why only a minority of the people in a given situation become active terrorists. And because of because a great portion uh, of uh, terrorism is group activity, group influence and decision-making processes are also an important element in generating terrorism. Yet, it is the interaction of individual psychological characteristics and these two situational factors that drives people to engage in terrorist activity. An example of the interaction between individual mental state and social environment can be seen in the results of a study of lone actors uh, in Israel that uh, uh, Boaz Ganor and I published recently. In this study, we found, among other things, that two thirds of the participants suffered from severe psychopathological conditions and that the dominant motivation of about half of the sample of independent actors which we examined was a desire to die. The interaction between individual characteristics and situational factor, factors is demonstrated through the question, why have these assailants chosen to carry out attacks against Jews as an outlet for their mental predicament? Particularly, why have those whose main motivation was to cause their own death done so in a manner that is usually described as suicide by cup? rather than in a way that does not involve hurting other people. A simple answer to this question is that while ordinary suicide is forbidden in Islam, istishad, martyrdom, is highly recommended and adored. In a broader sense, we can say that by choosing attacks on Jews as a way to end their own lives, suicidal assailants use the socially accepted values of nationalism and defense of religion for justifying the socially unaccepted act of committing suicide. Beyond this basic feature, during the period under consideration, the, 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 the uh, uh, wave of uh, terrorist attacks that started in uh, 2015, attacks by Palestinian individuals, which resulted in uh, the death of perpetrators, were the center of media coverage and public awareness in Palestinian society. Social media posts in which young adults uh, declared their intention to become shahids gained overwhelming publicity. A public opinion poll found that 67% uh, of the representative uh, sample of uh, Palestinian population supported knife attacks against uh, Israeli. Thus, the forum and the, the, the men and uh, the women who uh, wanted to end their, their lives, uh, this course of, of action uh, not only became the most salient choice, but also an act that uh, granted them a feeling of personal significance because these attacks were admired by many people in their society as idealistic and heroic. This is a clear, uh, uh, I think, example of interaction between between uh, um, uh, individual mental state and social factors. Um, apparently, in most cases, the desire to carry out an attack that was likely to cause the death of the assailant was the result of a synergy between the perpetrator's mental state and public atmosphere, which influenced the timing of the attack and the way in which it was carried out. Beyond this specific example, it should be noted that uh, the relative importance of personality characteristics varies across situations. Uh, that is, some people would resort to terrorism in uh, response to a wider variety of circum circumstantial conditions and triggers. It, different personality characteristics may be relevant in different circumstances. And also certain circumstances will cause more people to resort to terrorism. Hopefully, new research will expand our understanding of these interactions. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Professor Malawi, for these uh, wonderful insights. And um, so we will now uh, start with a moderated uh, discussion. I will uh, uh, ask a few questions. Uh, if you have any questions that you would like to pose, I already received uh, a couple. Please um, send them uh, privately to uh, Daphne uh, Berry, and uh, uh, she will forward it uh, uh, to us. Um, and what, the first question that I that I have, and, and this is really um, addressed uh, uh, for for all members of uh, of the panel. Um, so in 2005, one year after the um, Madrid train bombings, um, a summit on, on terrorism, security, and democracy convened in uh, Madrid. And there was a working committee in that summit, uh, the Committee on the Psychological Roots of uh, Terrorism, which was actually chaired by uh, Professor uh, Jerry Post. And one of the conclusions of that committee was that explan explanations at the level of individual psychology are insufficient in trying to understand why people become involved in, in terrorism. I took this quote actually from uh, uh, one of uh, uh, Jerry Post's uh, book, which I read earlier uh, today. Um, and so my question for, um, for the panelists was, what, what are the contributions that psychology can actually make in our quest to understand terrorist behavior and what are the limits um, of that contribution? Um, so I'm not sure who wants to go first. Uh, maybe we'll, um, Jessica, maybe I'll pick on you. <laughs> oh gosh, I, I remember I was at that conference and uh, I, I felt that it was kind of a campaign against someone who had studied psychoanalysis. That's what I thought. Um, I, you know, I think um, psychoanalysis was very much out of fashion. It's, it's somewhat more in fashion now um, because neuroscientists are finding some evidence. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, I, I think nobody's, I think our, Ariel actually put it really well. Nobody's suggesting that psychological traits or factors are enough to explain terrorism but neither is policy, uh, grievance, ideology. Um, it, you know, it, it is, and, and I think this is one of the reasons why, why John, John Horgan and I were so uh, frankly annoyed by Mark Sageman's trashing the field. I, I think it's a field that is inherently multidisciplinary and it's great that people from all kinds of disciplines are entering, entering the field. You cannot study terrorism as a political scientist without reference to psychology and you can't study it with psychology alone. That, that would be my um, response. Okay, um, great. Jo John, you wanna add anything? 100% uh, agree with everything Jessica just said. Uh, you know, I mean, for me, psychology is about trying to understand how decisions get made by people and people in, in, in certain situations, in group situations in particular. Um, you know, Walter Reich was very fond of saying that no one discipline should have a monopoly in the study of terrorism. And I think sometimes as psychologists, we'll, we'll talk the talk, but you know, behind closed doors, we still have this view that, well, okay, psychology isn't the best discipline, but it does give us special types of insights into uh, into the terrorist. I think your your point about limitations, Asaf, is, 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 is absolutely critical. We don't do enough of that. And so for me, when I when I encourage my own students to think about what a psychology of terrorism is and what it isn't, it's about trying to figure out where those boundary points might be. What are the things that psychology can't explain? And that's when you start to really appreciate the value of the interdisciplinary work. You know, motivation would seem to be the sort of the, the bread and butter of the psychologist who studies terrorism. And yet, motivation is just one of these um, super hard problems to crack. And, and as Jessica rightly said, um, um, uh, you know, and, and with respect to Mark Sageman, he was dead wrong about, about the field. And he was, he's also dead wrong about psychology um, because to, to reduce the psychology of terrorism to um, um, a, a rather circular discussion about, you know, 
not making enough progress on terrorist motivation, I think, is to completely miss the point of, of what psychology has to offer. And uh, actually, uh, you, you know, I, I wanted to ask you uh, um, the question about, about Mark Sageman. Um, let me first see if, if Professor Marari or Professor Corrado, would you like to also uh, address? Yeah. Please. I'd like to, to make two short, brief notes on this question. One is, um, for many years I used to, to uh, uh, tell my, my students, uh, talking about terrorism, I used to tell my students that uh, uh, God did not create uh, psychological problems or economical problems or... Uh, or, or uh, uh, sociological problems. God created problems. Now we, uh, with our limited uh, uh, understanding, uh, our limited education, uh, we, we are educated by uh, faculties, we try to interpret the problems that God created as psychological or economical, etc. Now, the, in real life, the approach must always be interdisciplinary. In psychology, being the study of, uh, of uh, human behavior is always relevant. Another thing is that, uh, that uh, uh, we, have, we have focused here uh, in this uh, conference and usually uh, talking about psychology and terrorism people uh, do, do the same. We have focused on individual psychology, on psychopathology, etc. Uh, on, uh, but but uh, psychology is relevant to terrorism research in uh, uh, in several other important ways. For instance, um, uh, I think um, it has already been noted here uh, that uh, Jessica said I think uh, that uh, uh, terrorism is a is a uh, is a form of psychological warfare, which is uh, well 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 I think. Uh, uh, a recognized uh, uh, statement uh, and psychological warfare as such uh, should be analyzed uh, inter with uh, psychological tools. Uh, take uh, for one example, uh, the, the issue of public opinion on terrorism. It's, it's uh, a major psychological problem. The terrorists win or, or, or lose uh, uh, by the impact that they make on public opinion, their own, uh, their own public, uh, the, the, the groups uh, represent uh, certain populations, and the, the public uh, that they're fighting against. Now, uh, uh, the question of uh, deterrence, for instance, is it possible to deter terrorists? I don't want to give uh, uh, to our lecture on this subject here which is very interesting uh, subject, of course, but this is a, a, a purely psychological question. And psychology has not dealt enough with these other psychological issues uh, concerning terrorism yet. Okay, thank you. Professor Quadro, would you like to also, uh, you're on uh, mute. I, I guess I think Sageman is not aware, he's not aware that, for example, the shift from DSM four to DSM five is based on science. It's not based on a, the notion of psychology or, or psychoanalytic approaches without some neurological basis for it or genetic basis for it. So when you look at the medical models and advances in the medical models of understanding, you know, diseases and in, in, in the you know, heart disease or cancer, the same the advances in understanding how the human mind works genetically, uh, uh, for example, in our work on, on, on violent youth, the, the role of neurotransmitters was, we had no understanding of that prior to some of the research that came out in the 90s with Terry Moffat and a particular MAOA gene. And, and what we're arguing from criminology uh, is that terrorism is a form of violence. In the types of individuals who are willing to engage in violence, 
in criminology, no one denies the biological, psychological basis of it. So why, if it's a form of terror, if it's a form of violence, in the general explanation involves an interaction between biology, genetics, the brain, and situational context. You join a gang for, 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 for a combination of social and, 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 and psychological reasons. Uh, same when we look at serial killers. In our study, we have some serial killers. When you look at the distinguishing symptom profile, it, you can distinguish between a serial killer and a one-on homicide person. And it's the psychological profile, which has a neurological basis, low empathy based on, on, on a variety of neurotransmitters. So in the sense, Sajman to me is talking about our understanding from the 70s and 80s, not what's going on the last 20 years. The advances are phenomenal. Uh, uh, and they're coming out interdisciplinary. And that's why you know, his, his understanding of psychology is based, I think, on, on really outdated uh, understandings. And, and this really leads me into my, my next question, because I, as I was thinking of, of, of uh, uh, Mark Sageman's uh, you know, scathing uh, criticism of the state of, of terrorism studies, uh, which was published, I think, in 2014, um, I was watching uh, John Horgan, uh, one of presentation you gave uh, a year or so ago, John, and, and I remember that you, um, you described the current state of terrorism research as the, the golden age. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that that's what I, what I heard you say. And I think that the, the, the contrast between what, what, how Sageman described um, terrorism studies, the state of terrorism studies, and how you described it was, was really, uh, uh, was really uh, uh, stark. And, um, I was wondering, you know, picking up on this on this point, and and also Professor Grada, you you just mentioned also that there have been really such significant advances. I was wondering if you could, uh, if, if if all of you could could maybe comment on where do you see the most important contributions um, in recent years, both you know in terrorism studies more generally, and and maybe also specifically when it comes to uh, the study of, of of psychology. Why are we in this golden age? I mean, I obviously tend to agree much more with the. Uh, uh, John, then, then with uh, Mark Sageman on this point, but but could you maybe share with the uh, um, the audience a bit, you know, give us some examples of, of where do we, where have we made uh, so, such uh, contributions in, in recent years? I'm I'm happy to jump in if that's that's okay. Um, lots and lots and lots of reasons. Uh, uh, I mean, I think the data that's available to us is of a better quality. I think we are using um, better methods. We are far more transparent in our methodology. We're far more transparent in our findings. To echo a point that Ariel has, has, has made many, many times, you know, terrorism studies has gone from being this, this fringe thing to now being um, uh, an area where we're seeing tremendous growth and investment of resource and, and, and real Real deal, interdisciplinary, collaborative work. Um, I think, I think there are other issues here as well, sort of less obvious issues, in that there are more and more people now doing terrorism research than ever before. For me, one of the most exciting developments is seeing far more graduate students engage in in, in terrorism research at the masters and PhD level. One of the points that you know you made earlier, Asaf, about the interdisciplinary nature of what we're doing. I think that's simultaneously both a, 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 an intimidating and exciting feature of the work that we do. And a conversation I often have with graduate students is don't let that prevent you from, from diving in and, and wrestling with these questions. Um, because um, the first step to really appreciating or understanding terrorism is appreciating just how damn complicated it is. And, 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 and I think I've been studying this for 20 years now, and, and, and I still feel like I'm just making teeny tiny incremental progress in, 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 in my understanding of it. Despite that, I think we have made astonishing gains over the last 15 to 20 years. Uh, see, uh, I, I think in our NATO advanced research workshop that, that we just did a year ago, to me, the gold standard of, 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 of theories and our contributions mm -hmm 
is how do we affect policy? Uh, so when, when Ariel and I and Gunda Versner put this workshop together, we had, I believe, 16 countries and we had intelligence agencies from in, involved with all those countries. And they said to us from a practical perspective of dealing with terrorism, that without these psychological profiles, and that's what Jerry stood for, without them, they feel helpless in the field because they deal every day with, to what extent is this individual a threat or a risk? And to the extent that they get it wrong, it's a disaster for them. And they're saying all the, the process-based instruments have not worked. So what we're left with, I think, is Ariel's point, is unless we, you know, our contributions has been, have been incremental, but substantial, because they come to us and say, we need these instruments to improve our ability on a case-by-case -case basis to deal with this. So the contribution is, is that, that it affects policy at the case level. To me, that's our ultimate contribution. We go from theory to how do we help uh, uh, this, this problem? Um, I wanted to touch upon uh, um, uh, another issue and this is um, related also to, uh, to social psychology. And I wanted to turn to uh, Professor uh, um, uh, Stern you um, so you published earlier this month um, an article, a really interesting article, which I highly recommend in uh, uh, in foreign policy. And you noticed you, you noted in this article that um, a sizable portion of, of Western societies, perhaps up to a third, according to some research, um, is as you called it predisposed to authoritarianism. Um, I was wondering if you could sh you know uh, share a, a bit. Uh, discuss uh, uh, this argument of yours, but uh, explain it, uh, uh, what you mean by that. And what, what do you think are the social psychological mechanisms that are at play here? Um, and also what kind of conclusions follow from this, from this insight of yours? Well, first I, I need to be clear that my co-author does the actual research and she, um, she was at Princeton and uh, she, I think really predicted the rise of um, the, um, Karen Stenner is her name. She, she predicted the, the rise of the populist right based on her studies of what, how authoritarians as she defines them get triggered. And for authoritarians as she defines them are people who cannot bear diversity, diversity of thought, uh, diversity of gender, uh, diversity uh, uh, of ethnicity. And that as some societies get more and more multi-ethnic, more and more immigration over time, she anticipated that we would see a rise of the populist right. Um, she's now in Australia. She's not, uh, commonly writing for, um, well, not for, especially for a popular audience. When I first read her work, I, I was in the middle of writing a, a, a book about Radovan Karadzic, but I was seeing uh, that something similar, this uh, ethnic and racial antagonism was growing in the United States. And her work was so exciting to me that I was literally dancing around the room. And I called her in Australia and she said, you know, thank you for telling me what my work meant to you. Let's write something together. And we didn't um, until quite recently. So um, my role to be perfectly honest was more to get her, um, well, to translate her work um, with her, um, but, and to, to put it in a, in a contemporary context. I think we're gonna do it again. Um, I think we'll do more of it. You know, obviously the, the hard right terrorism that we're seeing as well as hard left um, really helps us, I think, understand the importance of her work. But part of it 
um, comes her findings come from twin studies. That's one of the really interesting um, aspects of the work that it does seem that people are inherently unable to bear too much diversity, uh, that, that, it, that it is partly heritable. In fact, at least 50% heritable. Yeah. So she does spectacular work. I highly recommend it. Um, but it, it, most of her work, it, it takes some effort. <laughs> I got her to write it in a simple way. If, if we could stay for uh, uh, on the issue of, of the of the far right, um, you know, one of these one of the new uh, phenomena that we witness, and especially in the last uh, uh, few years, um, is the growing uh, attraction to or attractiveness of, of conspiracy theories. Um, not only in the United States, uh, perhaps most significant, perhaps most significantly in the United States, but not exclusively. And I was wondering if uh, if any of you um, can share other any. Uh, is there any uh, ongoing uh, or new emerging uh, psychological research um, that could help us uh, gain some insights into um, the motivations or the reasons why people are prone to um, adopting conspiracy theories? Uh, this seems to be something which uh, is very, very relevant uh, these days. I was wondering if you could, uh, if you have any uh, comments on that. I, I, we, we are, um, we've been focusing on an ideological spectrum and comparing the profiles across the different ideological, all the way from the anarchists to the extreme right, to the uh, environmentalists, uh, to, to the various types of jihadi. And, um, you know, the, the, what, what you're seeing is certain traits like alcoholism, uh, business failures, all events that at the individual level, you can't cope with the responsibility for what's happened to you. So loss of status, uh, uh, what, 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 what immigration has done historically is someone's going to lose a status position and it's typically going to be structural. So for example, when you look at the rise of the right in Germany, it's overwhelmingly in the Eastern states the launders there, right? Overwhelmingly, they are disproportionately at a disadvantage in terms of status and jobs, even when they move to the Western states. Their dialects uh, uh, set up negative stereotypes, which they can't cope with. And then they look for the scapegoats, the classic fascist. You look for a scapegoat, and the scapegoat are immigrants or modern society, which is changing the role of women. So for example, in, in Amanda and, and, and our team have done quite a few studies on, on incels, the involuntary celibates. And for them, the humiliation is the key. They feel humiliated. Uh, but the key, then the question becomes, a lot of people are threatened by that, by that humiliation or the inability to have the status of a male. So that's the violence. And we're seeing it across income levels. So it's not just a, a, a lower income individual, it's across income. So that suggests again, the psychological profile, the inability to cope with change. The other theme that, we, that, that we've been working on is the speed of change. It, it's moving so fast, uh, unprecedented, that the ability of people to adapt for example, high IQ, uh, extroversion, uh, 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 equanimous temperament. This is Jerome Keegan's work at Harvard. Those are critical issues for your ability to adapt. If you don't have that, you are going to lose. And it's that loss of status that we see affecting the right wing uh, uh, far more than the other ideological bases. If I could add uh, a word to this uh, question of uh, conspiracy theories, I think that uh, it's mainly a question of uh, uh, cognitive dissonance. People invent or, or stick to conspiracy theories uh, because uh, this is a way to solve cognitive dissonance between 
between uh, what they believe in and uh, the bare facts that they see on television and read in the newspapers. See, look, for example, at the conspiracy theories uh, prevalent uh, in the uh, Islamic world after 9-11. They have to explain it somehow in a way acceptable, but this is a cognitive dissonance par excellence. And it, I don't know if there are more cognitive, more uh, um, conspiracy theories today than uh, let's say 50 years ago. Uh, I think they get more prominence because of social media and uh, also perhaps uh, are, uh, are, uh, get uh, uh, a broader spread because of uh, social media. Just a couple of quick points, if I may. Uh, there is a very, very rich social psychology um, research base on conspiracy theory. Um, as someone who studies terrorism, I mean, I see elements of conspiratorial thinking in just about every terrorist movement. The key thing, um, one of the key things I think is, is really important is on, is on trying to have a better understanding of how we feel when we embrace conspiracy theory. So again, we can think about them in terms of content, the ideas, and the function of those ideas, whether it's about blaming or displacement or justifying normalizing violence, but the feeling we get from being part of, of this perceived in-group and having access to special knowledge can be, can be like a warm blanket, particularly in times of uncertainty. I mean, that's one of the reasons why we've seen this extraordinary explosion in popularity um, associated with, uh, with QAnon, something that just a year and a half ago was this tiny, um, uh, you know, unusual, completely off the wall fringe set of views that just um, um, uh, combined with um, uh, Trump's legitimization of QAnon and the COVID pandemic that just um, uh, made for a perfect storm of events that just exploded in terms of its popularity. Now, I, I'd like to add a small point. Uh, I was teaching a course that uh, this fall that involves students following uh, mostly hard right, but also QAnon on fringe social media sites. And one of the students wrote an essay saying, I fell into QAnon for a while, for a couple of days. And so I asked the class, would anybody like to say about how they fell into QAnon? And the person who wrote the essay was not the one to respond. By the end of the class, six young women all of whom were very left-leaning, very progressive, admitted that they had fallen into QAnon for at least several days. Why? Because of the story about pedophiles. There's, what's so amazing about this conspiracy theory, but also about the algorithm that spreads it, is that it spreads a part of the conspiracy theory that appeals to the individual so that people get brought into QAnon from many different routes. Um, that's it. Jessica, Amanda did a study of that uh, right on the network. Amanda, can you briefly describe that di network dynamic? Oh yeah, so it was uh, focused on incels on, on YouTube. And what we did is, is mapped the algorithm of video recommendations of going from something like a gamer community on YouTube. So looking at different types of games to more um, nefarious uh, grievance driven incel uh, rhetoric videos. So we kind of mapped how these groups connect on YouTube and what the video recommendations will send people on these different paths between these different subgroups. So it's quite interesting and I'm sure um, bringing it to different platforms, this idea of it being more of a social network and how we're, how those pathways go, it would be interesting to see it on something like Facebook or Twitter. So hopefully we can do that uh, in the future. Thank you. And uh, I know we've been keeping you for a long time, but let me just ask maybe the panel one, one final question. Um, Looking forward into the future uh, and, and the study of um, psychological aspects of terrorism, what do you think are the main puzzles um, that are still kind of obviously, you know, we, we talked about, you know, obviously the, the, re the reasons, the, the basic motivations, why people uh, choose violence. Um, John, in your presentation, you talked a bit about mobilization as I think a key puzzle. Um, I'd like to really hear from, from all of you. What do you think are kind of like the next big 
uh, contributions that are still left to be made in the in the study of, of psychological aspects of terrorism? What are the big open questions that are still not addressed? I think ironically, some of the most practical solutions for dealing with terrorism will come from not directly asking questions about terrorist motivation. Mm -hmm. I think some of this has to do with the, the, the really, really exciting research we've seen over the last several years on bystanders. We know that not all bystanders are created equal, of course, um, but starting with uh, going back to Paul Gill and others' research on, on lone actors, the idea that um, it's not, again, it's not that we don't see it coming, we're just not reporting it. There is a story to be told and a story to be uncovered about why things are not being reported. And, and I think there, it, it, is, it, it offers us insight into real world practical differences we can make by just shifting this, the focus ever so slightly. I mean, I wouldn't be so naive as to say that we're going to, or that we should abandon the search for terrorist motivation I'm simply saying that um, if, we, if we only focus on that one issue, we're going to find that there are so many more practical avenues open to us that will forever remain obscured. Yeah. Uh, Professor uh, Corrado, would you? Uh, <clears throat> I, I, think what the, I think what's exciting is that the, the, the trend that, uh, that I was trying to present today the complexity of the models that we're developing now are going to be greatly assisted by artificial intelligence uh, methodologies and you know based on a sort of bayesian methodology of, of of constantly iterative things along john's line if you add a little bit of understanding here if you add a little bit of knowledge there you can create a very dynamic model of, 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 of policy, theory-based policy. I think that's where they, I, I, I find exciting. So when, when I work with intelligence agencies, they're not afraid of complexity as long as, it, as long as they have the opportunity to have the resources to develop this, these, these complex models. So I think artificial intelligence the ability to, and again, there's some ethical issues here, the ability to gather enormous amounts of data off the internet. So uh, the, the, the sort, of, sort of the viability of, of the personality inventory uh, model that we've got from, depends on massive amounts of information because each individual is so complex. So I think we got to, we, I think we, there'll be a movement away from saying, oh, we should be looking at groups of based characteristics down to the distinctiveness of individuals because it's such a low base rate phenomenon. You know, it, it, so if you don't get down to a greater and greater specificity of, of risk protective factors, uh, you, you're not gonna, you're gonna have too many false, uh, I would say too many false negatives and false positives. Thank you. Professor Stern, would you uh, like to comment? Yeah, I, something that interests me a lot is something Professor Corrado spoke about a few minutes ago, the, the idea that humiliation and status loss, we're seeing the, uh, really good data that those are important factors um, in explaining the, the resurgence of, of the hard right. Um, and I think it would be fascinating to think about um, why do some people react that way to humiliation and status loss and others don't? Um, and is there some way, wh what can we learn about resilience? Um, what can we learn about, you know, is there anything that could go into countering terrorism if we learn something about that kind of resilience? Thank you. And finally, Professor Marari, any thoughts from you? You're, you're on mute. I'm sorry. Well, I think because uh, this, this is the age of uh, uh, mass communication, internet, uh, social media, and uh, 
this fact, uh, I think, uh, uh, influences uh, everything, every aspect of our lives, including, of course, terrorism. Now, especially because uh, terrorism is a form of psychological warfare, uh, mass communication uh, and uh, uh, social media, especially, and uh, uh, this uh, sort of things uh, 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 are probably the most uh, uh, important avenues of research in the future, how, how these uh, instruments uh, influence terrorism and how they can be used for counter-terrorism. And uh, this is especially uh, true, I think, in view of the rise of, uh, of lone actor terrorism, uh, phenomenon that has indeed risen in the last uh, 10 years or a bit more. Uh, and uh, now uh, I think um, low nectar terrorism um, um, uh, relies much on the imagined communities uh, of, the, of the social media. And uh, this, is, uh, this is another reason why I think uh, uh, research on the influence of, uh, uh, of uh, new media, uh, mass media uh, on terrorism is going to be uh, extremely important and also, uh, and also uh, I think, uh, 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 influential uh, in, uh, in uh, practical ways. I think that uh, Boaz has been doing much work on this. Uh, I hope uh, you'll have an opportunity to, to say something about it. Absolutely, and uh, maybe uh, Boaz will uh, touch upon this uh, tomorrow. And I want to remind everybody uh, that um, tomorrow we have a, a follow-on session where we'll uh, focus on, on counterterrorism. This has been tremendously uh, uh, insightful, and I really, really thank you, uh, all, all the speakers, first of all, for sharing uh, your thoughts and reflections on, uh, on Jerry Post. Um, he really was a, a multidimensional man, and, and, and that came, I think, across very, very nicely in your um, in your insights. And it was also really uh, wonderful to see how many different aspects of um, research, uh, certainly uh, when it comes to the to psychological aspects of, of, of terrorism, um, there's hardly any, any area of, of research that has been left untouched by, uh, by Jerry Post's insight. And I think that we can also um, uh, take this uh, beyond uh, psychological aspects of, 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 of terrorism, because really, um, I think Professor Post has been very much uh, responsible for, uh, for highlighting and, and raising the profile of psychological level um, research um, in our general understanding of terrorism, right? Uh, it is today, I believe, uh, we can safely say that it is one of the uh, uh, accepted conventional approaches to, uh, to studying terrorism, right? Anybody who takes any terrorism class, uh, we cannot uh, ignore psychological um, aspects and, uh, and so Professor Post deserves a lot of uh, uh, credit uh, for that. Um, I wanna thank all the speakers for being here. I wanna thank everybody else who has tuned in. I wanna uh, send another uh, shout out and thank you for, uh, to Jerry's um, family. Um, it's been wonderful to see uh, to seeing you here and to having you here. And um, again, this is only the first part. Please um, come back to us tomorrow. Join us uh, tomorrow at the same time, uh, 11 a.m. Eastern Central, uh, Eastern uh, Standard Time. And um, thank you, everybody. Have a good evening or a good rest of the day, wherever you are. All the best. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you, you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.